can win in today's economy. Now, that is a bit of a summary of a much larger issue. Steve Siebold is on set here to talk to us. There's Steve right there, mental toughness expert and author of How Rich People Think. He's written a lot of books. He's worldwide. He also, in 1984, was broke, as I understand it, Steve. And yes. uh, you have turned that into a multi-million dollar success story. Congratulations. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks a lot for being here because uh, I think that this is one of those topics. And we try to, you know, create topics for the show that aren't just important because we think they're important, but because hopefully people out there consider them important. That's why they watch and maybe they get something out of it. And, and I thought this was a perfect example of that. I mentioned that you were down. You turned it into something that has become quite successful. You are a mental toughness expert. Never heard of that. I know you have a professional sports background in tennis and so forth. How does one become a mental toughness expert and what does that mean? Well, I was a professional tennis player back in the 80s, and, uh, and I was, uh, my goal was to be top 50 in the world. I only made it to the top 500, and I wanted to know why. I knew the difference was mental, so I became sort of obsessed mm -hmm. with uh, studying the topic, mm -hmm. and I just, I, that's all I did. I mean, that's all I did all through college, and I, and I kind of figured it out, but by the time I did, I was too old to go back to tennis, so started coaching athletes and, and uh, professional athletes, amateur athletes, and mental toughness, and then went on to companies. And what are some of the keys just generally uh, to be successful, or at least to make some progress in mental toughness. I want to get to your story here and rich people think and how they do and how that compares maybe to most people in the middle class. We'll do that momentarily, but just as a basic principle or two, what can people take out of our conversation when it comes to being mentally tough? Well, I think one thing is focus. You've got to have incredible focus to have. The higher level focus you have, the more mentally tough you're going to be. You've got to decide that you're going to be persistent. You're going to hang in there and do whatever it takes. And the basic success principles, principles as we all have learned over the years, really apply in mental toughness. Okay, now one thing that uh, jumped out at me was I would take what you just said, and I, I, could, I could wrap my brain around that. I mean, that was not something that was so complicated that I, I, I'm left with uh, open mouth. I get it. But when I read what your message is, it doesn't translate to what I think it would. And here's what I mean. You said being determined, being focused, do hard work. And yet, you go, I believe, into the belief that that's not enough to be successful in terms of being rich or not. That this working hard isn't the way to necessarily look at it. It's more of a thinking game. It's more of a leverage game. Is that a fair assessment, or what does that mean? Definitely, it's a different kind of hard work. I think it's it's thinking. I think that the rich are are masters at leveraging their thought processes. What does that mean? Well, for the most part, I think it means that they're they're not operating out of fear. Like most of us are terrified about money, especially with the economy. Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my house? I mean, my God, what if we run out of money? Where the you know all those fears. And right now, the wealthy aren't doing that. The wealthy are thinking, how can I capitalize on this new economy, this new set of opportunities that's really unprecedented? Isn't it also good, though, even if you've not yet uh, you know, reached the point, uh, like most of us haven't, where you're rich, where you could look at uh, a loss of a job. You could look at the economy, and you could look at it as an opportunity, and you could go with that. And if you focus on that approach, that's part of the battle, is it not? Absolutely. Mort Zuckerman, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Ellis, but Mort Zuckerman wrote an article in Wall Street Journal today called The End of Optimism in America. Mm -hmm. And I love Mort Zuckerman, but mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't disagree more. I mm -hmm. mean, this is a time of unbelievable opportunity. And I don't mean that out of positive thinking. I mean it out of critical thinking. I mean, there's all these new problems to solve, and a lot of people are going to get rich getting paid to solve them. And they're not just cultural, societal problems, which there are abundance of, uh, but it, there are a lot of individual examples because, again, of the recession, the economy, the job loss, the um, unemployment number and so forth, we all know what they are, but you're suggesting that even despite all that, you could still win. Absolutely. I mean, people that are, that are out there thinking the, 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 in the middle class, let's say, they're struggling, they're thinking, I need a job. Instead of thinking, I need a job, think of how a rich person would approach making money. They would think, okay, maybe there are no jobs though in the, in the linear world of jobs where you go, you apply, you get a job, they pay you a salary, that type of thing. But all these businesses, all these small companies and mid-sized companies need to generate revenue and they're scared to bring people on to create more overhead. So why not approach these companies and say, you know what, give me your highest margin product and I'll sell more of it and I'll do it for two weeks. And if I don't succeed, you can get rid of me. I won't get paid. And if I do, bring me on as a commission salesperson. There's so many opportunities like that. I know personally the idea of having that fear. I know that you know that uh, feeling of having fear, and I know there are tens of thousands of people that have that as well. But you need to somehow find that spot where you put that aside or allow it to serve as a motivator but to not allow it to consume you. Easier said than done, not trying to preach to anybody, but I have found that that is one big step toward getting in the right direction. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you think like the masses, you're going to get what the masses get. And it's not a put down to the masses, but typically most people don't get what they want because they're following people who've never gotten what they wanted. Good enough. And it just perpetuates itself. All right, here's the book. It's called How Rich People Think. We're going to come back and we'll talk a little bit about that. 26 years, this gentleman has interviewed people who are successful, rich and otherwise. And we're going to talk to him about a half a dozen easy to understand points that separate well, frankly, people that are rich and successful and most of us that are not. And yet Steve will also tell us how we can be successful. So we'll get to those half dozen points in our next session. Steve Seabold is with us. We're talking about how rich people think and how that applies to you. He's Steve Amelis. You're watching I Talk on PCNC. I'm looking at uh, a couple of uh, excerpts from different books that Steve has written through the course of the years. If you get out of bed this morning and went to work because you wanted to, you are in control of money. If you get out of bed this morning because you had to, money is in control of you. That's pretty well uh, a self-fulfilling, uh, I guess, prophecy in some respects, Steve, depending on what your attitude is when you wake up. You've approached a lot of people through 26 years on various ways that they could be successful. Uh, talk to us, first of all, about the book and how you get to 26 years of interviewing people that are successful. You know, I just wanted to be rich. I grew up in Chicago around a bunch of rich kids. I was not a rich kid, but I grew up playing tennis on the junior circuit. And a lot of rich kids, tennis courts and servants and all that stuff. And I thought, this looks pretty good. I can live with this. <laughs> yeah, right. And I went to college like most of us did. And I didn't hear anything but, well, you're never going to be fat. You're never going to be, in other words, rich. You're never going to make a lot. You know, well, it's tough out there. And, and I thought, these people don't know anything about being rich, which I didn't think they did. So I started interviewing the rich. I luckily got in their circles. And it's been 26 years of just chasing them literally around the world, learning how they think and then adopting, trying to adopt their philosophies, habits, and behaviors, and it's made a big difference. All right, Steve's written a number of books. That's the latest, and in fact, you'll be able to get uh, the book and all the information about it at howrichpeoplethinkbook.com. I want to get to uh, a couple of quick pointers, and we'll run through it uh, one by one. Middle class focuses on saving, world class focuses on earning. What does that mean? Well, saving is obviously important. I've been criticized a lot for this lately. And it, saving is obviously critical, especially especially now. You need, a, you need a nest egg, no question. But the focus, the mental focus, where, where do you direct your mental energy? The rich direct their mental energy toward earning, toward creating large numbers, especially they will in the new economy, because instead of getting 8% on your investments, you're probably going to get 4 or 5 for the next maybe 5 or 10 years. So right. you're going to have to earn more to be back where you were before, getting 8 to 10% on investments. They focus on earning. But see, I have to tell you, when I did read that, and, and, and there was a part of me that my antenna went up, wait a second, now, you, you don't disparage the mechanics of saving, and yet you say you can be preoccupied with that, meaning that you're thrilled with the fact you save 35 cents on a loaf of bread rather than maybe using that energy elsewhere. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on clipping coupons. Nothing wrong with clipping. I've done it. I mean, no, nothing wrong with that. I'm not putting that down, but my, if my mental energy is focused on that, on really hoarding my money, I've got X amount of dollars and I'm going to hoard it and save it, I'm going to put it in my mattress so the banks don't fail or I don't, that's probably, I'm probably never going to be rich thinking and, like and that. And if I got you right, you're talking about people focusing here, this ought to be quite a visual on television, you're just <laughs> focusing here, not looking at what might be out here to get you out of looking down here. Yes. Is that pretty well, that pretty good summary? That's it. All right, let's go through this quick. Middle class focus on saving, we did that. Middle, middle class believes hard work creates wealth. We've touched on this earlier, world class believes leverage creates wealth. What's leverage in that context? They leverage, the rich leverage everything. Their money, their contacts, their credibility, everything, their knowledge, every, you name it, they leverage it. So while most of us are out there killing ourselves nine to five or whatever, or maybe more than that, maybe doing two or three jobs, they're thinking. They're, they're thinking of ways to leverage everything they have to become wealthier, and they just keep doing it. Middle class believes money is earned through labor. World class believes money is earned through thought. Pretty much the same idea. Right. They're thinking about solving problems. The, more, the bigger problem they solve, the richer they get. Uh, how about this? Middle class worries about running out of money. World class thinks about how to make more money. They're actively thinking about, I could take this and this, leverage it to get over there. Yeah, money, money is, the, is, is the wealthy person's friend. I mean, they're looking at it in terms of opportunity and excitement and the future, whereas most of us, I think, especially now, are thinking, I just hope I don't run out. I mean, that's a whole different world they're living in. I thought this was key. Uh, middle class operates from a fear-based consciousness. World class operates in a consciousness of abundance and freedom. What freedom? 
Well, freedom of anything, freedom of, of, of financial independence, freedom of uh, if you're rich, you can get up in the morning and do whatever you want to do. No one can tell you what to do because you, you can afford it. You can afford your own freedom. This you're not free without money. This doesn't fit in it, but you mentioned that while uh, the middle class is worried about everything uh, from who's going to win the Super Bowl to Jennifer Aniston's love life, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I, I have to tell you uh, that is a, uh, a level of skepticism, if not cynicism, that I share. I've talked about it through the years. We're all worried about Britney rather than the important things. And I, I speak with the broad brush right there. I, I, I do television shows just like you do all the time all over the world, and people are more worried about Jennifer Aniston's live life and Britney Spears, you know, that type right. of thing. And it's on national headlines. We need to know this stuff, and this is what people care about, and of course that's why they talk about it on the news. If we focused on what was important and what we really need to, to get wealthy and get what we want, we'd be a lot better off than we are. One last thing, Steve. Middle class sees money through the eyes of emotion. World class sees money through the eyes of logic. Now, there's a guy out there sitting there saying, wait a minute, I lost my job. What are you talking about with logic and emotion? Well, in mental toughness training, we help people separate logic and emotion. And that's where I think Mort Zuckerman of the Wall Street Journal really went wrong today. He's saying the end of optimism in America because he's looking at the economy and the future economy through the eyes of logic. And, and in this situation, I think we ought to look th through, through the eyes of emotion, which is motivation which is the history of this country. We're in Pennsylvania, right? This is the history of, this is the founding place of America. Right. I mean, if they didn't think emotionally, the colonists, that they could, they could take over and they could actually create America, logically, they, it would never work. But emotionally is what they, is what they used emotion to drive the That's revolution. That's an interesting balance. I've always professionally been trained to think logically, but I know there's a role for emotion, and it's all right here in the book, howrichpeoplethinkbook.com. Is that correct? You can get five free chapters, actually, if you go to howrichpeoplethinkbook.com. Okay, we'll get there. Thanks a lot. Great. I appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Alice. Okay. Appreciate it. All right.